today on the Perception and Action podcast. How well can we perceive the action opportunities available to others? What information do we use? Can we perceive nested affordances? That is, be sensitive not only to another person's action capabilities, but impending changes in those capabilities? Some implications for coaching. So it's time for a call to action. Hi, this is Rob Gray from Arizona State University. I've been on a now over 25-year journey as a researcher, professor, and high-performance consultant to understand how we acquire and adapt our perceptual motor skills. Welcome to the Perception in Action podcast, where I discuss how psychological research can be applied to improving performance, accelerating skill acquisition, and designing technologies. Before we get to today's topic, I want to tell you about my new book, Learning to Optimize Movement. Harnessing the Power of the Athlete-Environment Relationship, available now on Amazon in paperback and ebook formats. This book is the follow-up to my best-selling skill acquisition book, How We Learn to Move. In it, I discuss how we can go beyond learning basic coordination to becoming an elite mover, evidence-based principles for learning and coaching optimal movement. Take your game from proficiency to mastery. Now on to the show. In today's episode, I want to look at the very interesting topic of perceiving the affordances of others. Recall that an affordance is an opportunity for action conveyed by information from the environment. As an example discussed in my new book, the information provided by the rate of change of tau or tau dot allows us to perceive a variety of different affordances. Stopping right before you hit another player, hitting a player with a ton of force, etc., Research has shown that we are very good at picking up affordances for ourselves. We can detect whether objects are reachable, throwable, climbable, etc. for us, quite accurately. But what about perceiving the affordances of others? Can we pick up information from the environment to determine whether an object is reachable, throwable, or climbable for another person? How might we do this? This obviously has important implications for coaching. Being able to detect the action capacities of and affordances available to an athlete you're working with is invaluable in designing practice. So let's have a look at a few studies that have explored this topic. As per usual, there are two very different views of how we might perceive the affordances of others. The first, aligned with information processing and indirect views of perception, proposes that we do this by a process of mental simulation. That is, When we observe another person performing an action, this activates the neural mechanisms, mental models, motor programs, etc., that we use to produce the same action ourselves. This fits with the very popular concept of mirror neurons, which respond both when producing an action and when viewing someone else producing that same action. These, quote-unquote, enable the observer to use his or her own resources to penetrate the world of the other by means of a direct, automatic, and unconscious process of motor simulation, end quote. The alternative ecological view is, of course, that the perception of affordances of others is a direct information-driven process. That is, we pick up information directly from our environment that specifies the action capacities of others. There are a couple simple differences we should see between these two theories. First, if we are understanding another person's action through simulation of how we would do it, then we might predict that we would be poor at judging affordances of others with very different action capacities from ourselves. For example, a much taller or shorter person. Second, if you're using mental simulation, we should need to see the action being performed so that it triggers the appropriate mirror neurons to perceive the affordances of others. Neither of these would be predicted from an ecological approach. Because we're picking up information directly from the environment, we're not perceiving affordances in terms of what we can do, and we shouldn't need to actually see the action performed. For example, if a person is standing still, there's information that could be used to detect whether or not they can reach an object of a particular height. These two different explanations were compared in a 2000 study by Ramanzoni et al. In the study, participants were asked to make judgments about the affordance of reachability for another person. That is, they viewed another person just standing still with their arms at their side and were required to adjust the position of an object that was hung from the ceiling until it was at the maximum height that would be reachable for that person. After all the judgments were made, participants were asked to try to actually reach objects at different heights so their actual maximum reach height could be calculated. 
there were two manipulations added to tease apart the different theories. First, participants came to the study in pairs and were recruited such that one was shorter, 150 to 160 centimeters, and one was taller, 180 to 190 centimeters. If we buy the simulation approach, this should make it difficult for the participants to make accurate affordance judgments. That is, the judged maximum reach height for another person should be very different than the actual maximum height. The other very clever manipulation was to have the participant make the affordance judgment standing on platforms of different heights. So unbeknownst to them, in different conditions while viewing the other person, they stood at the same level on a platform of 7.5 centimeters or 15 centimeters higher. Why would this matter? Because in the ecological approach, we don't perceive the world in terms of units from physics. For example, we don't perceive height in terms of feet or meters. We perceive it in terms of our own action capacity. Specifically, we perceive height in terms of eye heights. That is, we perceive it relative to the height our eyes are above the ground. So for example, if an object was actually 12 feet above the ground, it would be perceived as being two eye heights tall for a person that was six foot and roughly two and a half eye heights tall for a person that was five feet tall. The same physical height is perceived differently because we don't see the world in terms of physical dimensions. We see it in terms of what it affords us in terms of performing actions. For the present purposes, the change in height of the platform the observer was standing on should change the perception of another person's affordances because it's altering the number of eye heights for the objects they're looking at. Finally, participants were also asked to judge the affordances of reachability for themselves. So they just looked at the object hanging on the rope and were asked to move it to a point where they could just touch it with no other person there. In all cases, participants were asked to judge reachability of themselves and others as if they were on the floor, not standing on any platforms. What was found? First, participants were very accurate in judging the affordances for both themselves and the other person. In these studies, we typically calculate the ratio of the perceived to the actual value. So in this case, the judged maximum height to the actual measured maximum height. In all conditions, ratios were close to one, indicating accurate affordance perception. So we can judge what is reachable for another person, even if they're much taller or much shorter than we are. Note, of course, when the observer was making the affordance judgment for the other person, they actually never saw the action being performed. The person just stood there. They never lifted their arm, never mind reaching for something above. And the judgments were still accurate. Finally, as predicted, there was a systematic effect of eye height on the affordance judgments, both for judging one's own and the other person's maximum reach height. To quote the authors, all of these results support the idea that information about ongoing and potential actions for another agent are specified in the optic array which simultaneously specifies the observer's instantaneous relationship to the environment. In other words, direct perception of information, not mental simulation, end quote. The next study I want to look at dives deeper into understanding the information we use to judge the affordances of others and puts a sports twist on things. It is one published by Wiest and colleagues in 2014. In particular, the authors were interested in what role the kinematic information we pick up from others might influence affordance perception. In this study, the authors focused on two more complex affordances than just reaching to touch an object. They looked at maximum reach height while jumping. So what was the highest point a person could reach while jumping in the air? If you think about it, it's highly relevant to sports. For example, a basketball player detecting whether an opponent will be able to block their shot or not. The second affordance they looked at was horizontal long jumping distance. If we can't actually observe a person doing these things, how might we perceive what they are capable of? In 1977, Runson proposed the kinematics of specification of dynamics principle. He proposed that because our movement is lawfully related to the forces that generated it, then it follows that information about these forces should be available for a perceiver through the movement kinematics. So, for example, we should be able to pick up information about a performer's ability to generate vertical propulsive force by viewing them performing actions like walking or squats. Because their movement kinematics for these actions will be directly related to the forces generated, there's information about force in the kinematics. We also expect there to be different levels of attunement to such kinematic information depending on experience. 
for example, in athletes of different sports or non-athletes. To test these ideas, the authors created point light videos of actors performing four different actions, squatting, walking, twisting, or standing on one leg. For those unfamiliar, a point light display is created by putting little lights on the different joints of a person and filming them moving in the dark. Critically then, the only information there is the movement kinematics. The first prediction of the study was that reports for both the maximal jump to reach distance and the horizontal long jumping distance should be more accurate after viewing point light videos of actors performing movements related to these affordances, squatting and walking, as compared to movements unrelated to these affordances, twisting and balancing on one leg. The other manipulation in the study was sporting experience. For the study, the authors recruited basketball players, soccer players, and a group of non-athletes. They predicted that basketball players would be superior to both soccer players and non-athletes in perceiving the affordance of jumping to reach, because it's a major part of their sport. They didn't expect to find any differences for the affordance of long jumping, because it was not seen as being a relevant affordance to detect for either sport. For the point light stimuli, three models, two female and one male, were used. Their maximum reach while jumping height ranged from 222 to 275 centimeters, while the maximum long jumping distance ranged from 145 to 220 centimeters. Like in the study we just looked at, the maximum judge values were combined with these actual values to create ratios where one would be perfect affordance perception. What was found? First, as predicted, the ratios after viewing squatting and walking were closer to one than the ratios after viewing balancing and twisting, confirming their prediction that perceptual reports would be more accurate after movements related to performing a vertical and a horizontal jump were viewed. In terms of sporting experience, the results were not as predicted. For both the jump-to-reach affordance and long-jump affordance, soccer and basketball players were significantly more accurate in perceiving the affordance of others than non-athletes. Furthermore, there was no significant difference between the accuracy of judgments for basketball and soccer players for either task. As the authors note in the discussion section, they may have greatly underestimated the experience soccer players have with jumping actions. For example, goalkeepers leaping to save a shot or players elevating to head the ball. While these don't specifically involve jumping to reach with the hand always, they do involve similar forces and action capacities. In sum, the authors conclude, quote, This research establishes that point light displays contain essential kinematic information for action scaled affordance perception. Observers could accurately perceive the action boundaries of another person after viewing point light motion depicting only the actor's joint centers. Additionally, we found further evidence that long-term experience in a sport results in attunement to kinematic information specifying domain-relevant affordances for others. End quote. In a 2018 study, Thomas and colleagues examined in more detail the jump to reach affordance we just looked at. One way that we could perceive another person's ability to do this would be just to pick up the lower order affordances. That is, their maximum reach height while not jumping, and their maximum jump height while not reaching, and then just add these two together in some cognitive process that combines them. But if you think about it, that is not likely to be very accurate because the act of reaching is nested within the act of jumping. So for example, if I swung my arms really hard to get higher in the air on my jump, that might impair the timing and accuracy of my reach to the object while in the air. The two things need to work together. The alternative in the ecological approach is that we just pick up the higher order affordance, jumping to reach directly. We don't compute it from its lower order parts, much in the same way as we don't compute tau by getting an object's size and then dividing it by the rate of change of its size. We just pick up the ratio directly. The direct pickup of higher order information, without any need for computation, fits with Runson's concept of the smart perceptual mechanism, which I discussed back in episode 362. To test the idea that we might have the equivalent of smart perceptual mechanisms for perceiving the affordance of others, Thomas and colleagues asked participants to make separate estimates of three different things. One, the maximum height a person standing in front of them could reach without jumping, two, the maximum height they could jump without reaching, and three, the maximum height they could reach while jumping. They also made these judgments for themselves. In all cases, they moved a target hanging from the ceiling to the judge maximum height again. What was found? The main comparison of interest in the study was how participants' judgments of the affordance of jumping to reach 
compared to an additive model estimate based on combining the lower order reaching and jumping affordances. For both judgments of one's own ability and the ability of another person, there were significant differences between these two things. From this, the authors concluded that, quote, the results also support Gibson's notion of information. The affordance of jump reaching height is specified by ambient optical information independent of related affordances. Regardless of whether jump reaching affordances for the self or for another person are being perceived, lower order affordances were not cognitively combined with a linear function to produce them. Furthermore, even when the lower order properties are themselves affordances, they do not additively combine to produce the affordance investigated in this task, end quote. A similar effect can be seen in a study of the perception of maximum distance throwing for others, published by G and Pan in 2019. Here, participants were asked to pick a ball for another person that would result in the furthest throw. Again, they were very good at this, and the affordance judgment was based on higher order information about the ball's size and mass. This concept was further investigated in a study by Wagman and colleagues published in 2018 that looked at the perception of nested affordances for another person. The concept of nested affordances is the idea that to achieve our main intended goal, we need to pick up and realize sub-goals or other related affordances. Performing a given action, for example, changing a light bulb, often requires performing a subordinate action, climbing a ladder, which itself requires performing additional subordinate actions, for example, stepping on an individual rung of the ladder, and so on. In terms of perceiving the affordances of others, if we're sensitive to nested affordances, it means that not only can we use direct information to detect the action capacities of another person, which we've already seen many examples of so far today, but we can also pick up impending changes in their action capacities. To investigate this, the authors looked at perceiving the affordances of reachability for another person under different nested task constraints to test whether the perceiver would exhibit prospective sensitivity, not only to the actor's current action capabilities, but also to impending changes in their capabilities. The conditions were one, reach with the fingertips of the outstretched hand while standing on the floor, two, reach with the fingertips of the outstretched hand while standing on a visible step stool, or three, reach with the distal end of a visible stick to be held in the actor's outstretched arm. Actors did not ever actually perform any of these behaviors or any of the required subordinate behaviors. For example, they never stood on the stool or picked up the stick or raised their arm. Rather, the actor merely stood next to the step stool or stick, depending on the condition, with his or her arms at their sides, while the perceiver reported the actor's maximum reaching height in that condition. What was found? When the judge maximum height was combined with the actual maximum height, the ratios were almost exactly one again for all three conditions, suggesting that we can perceive these types of nested affordances directly, again from information in the environment. For me, this brings into question the validity of using things like fundamental movement skills to assess athletes. For most of these, we are measuring simple lower order affordances rather than the higher order nested ones we see in most sports. The final study I want to look at today is one that tackles an issue that I know many people still struggle with when trying to understand the ecological approach to skill. That is the role of memory. This is something Andrew Wilson and I tried to hash out back in episode 392, but if you listen, you will hear that we had some struggle putting it into words. The problem is you can't understand or explain the ecological approach to memory using the traditional information processing one that we're all familiar with. There is no perceive, store, retrieve at different points in time. There is no memory as a thing. There is remembering, which is a temporally extended process. To quote the authors, perception is a continuous act without sharp divisions between present and past experience. Moreover, the momentary starts and stops in the impinging of stimulation on sense organs and receptors are incidental to perception. Such discontinuities may interrupt the flow of stimulation to the sense organs, but they are part and parcel of the process of information detection. Therefore, from an information-based perspective, there is no clear distinction between perception and memory. Rather, they are continuous processes. Awareness of affordances for the self and others persist over space and time, end quote. I know, I know, that probably just made your head explode. But let's look at a study that tried to investigate this. 
In a paper published in 2018, Wagman and colleagues tested whether the perception of quote-unquote remembered affordances show the same properties, in particular sensitivity to information, as perception of affordances in the moment. For the study, participants made judgments of maximum reaching height in the moment and remembered maximum reaching height. For the former, the task was like we've seen in the previous studies we've looked at today. The judgment was made with a person standing in front of the viewer. For the remembered task, the person making the judgment viewed the person standing in the experimental room for a few minutes. They both then laughed. The person making the judgment was then asked to do a bunch of distracting Sudoku puzzles. Finally, the person making the affordance judgment was asked to return to the room and make the reachability affordance judgment by moving the target hanging from the ceiling again. But critically, the other person was not in the room with them anymore. What was found? Both the actual and remembered affordance ratios were close to one, and there was no significant differences between them. This was the case both when the person was making the affordance judgments about a person that was taller than them and shorter than them. Finally, the remembered ratio was significantly more accurate than an additive model based on the remembered shoulder height and remembered arm height, which the participants were also asked to judge in separate parts of the experiment. So affordance judgments of others show all the sensitivity to information from the environment that we've seen in the other studies today without the information being present at the moment they were actually making the judgment. The authors conclude, quote, Overall, the results demonstrate a continuity between perceived and remembered affordances for others and are consistent with the conceptualization of perception and memory as continuous rather than discontinuous processes. End quote. To sum up, in today's episode, we saw a lot of evidence that there's information in our environment that allows us to pick up sport-relevant affordances for others, how high they can reach while jumping or throw balls of different weights and sizes. Importantly, we also saw that this requires becoming attuned to higher order information sources, which comes from experience. In future episodes, I'm going to consider how we might develop this very important ability as coaches. Okay, that's it for today's episode. Remember, you can contact me at robgray at asu.edu or follow me on Twitter at shakeyweights. To find out more about the podcast, please check out perceptionaction.com. Finally, to support the podcast and receive bonus materials, including a monthly coach meetup, please head over to patreon.com forward slash perception action. This is Rob Gray from ASU. Cheers for now and keep them coupled. Gone straight away.